Our text today is from the Gospel reading. Then Peter began to say unto him, Lo, we have left all and followed thee. What shall we have therefore? We had only been married a couple of weeks. My wife was out in the kitchen dressed in that frilly stuff you have on a honeymoon, making breakfast for the two of us. When I answered a knock at the front door, there stood an Indian on his way back to Oklahoma with his family, he said, pointing to a rusted old Buick parked out front. And could he have something to eat? Hey, honey, do you mind if we have company for breakfast? Why, no, dear. Invite him right in. And I can still see the expression on her face as they trooped into the kitchen. And she's counting them. One, little, two, little, three, little Indian, four. <laughs> Ten of them! Just like the nursery rhyme and the baby was cradled in a cardboard box. Well, they weren't kidding about being hungry. They ate just about everything in the house that there was to eat. And when he's leaving, he says, I'm running on empty. Uh, could you give me a tank of gas? I'll pay you back. And of course, he never did. Do you have any idea how many times that breakfast has come back to me? For I've had ten little Indians and more sitting around my table. The poor cannot pay you back. How can they? But God always does. According to his promise, he that is kind to the poor lendeth to the Lord. And the Lord shall repay him for all that he has done. That incident from long ago came to mind when I hear Simon asking in the text, Lord, we have followed all, left all to follow you. What are we going to get out of it? You've got to hand it to this likable fellow human being. He wore his heart on his sleeve. You never had to wonder what Simon was thinking, because he'd tell you. No mind games, no pretenses. What you see is what you get. If he had a problem with forgiveness, he said so. How many times shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Seven times? And if he didn't want to go fishing the wrong time of day in the wrong part of the lake, he said that too. His emotions were as changeable and stormy as the Sea of Galilee where he came from. One minute, he's walking on the water to Jesus. The next minute, he's sinking beneath the waves. One second, Jesus praises him for his magnificent confession. Ten seconds later, Jesus has to scold him. Get thee behind me, Satan. And now we hear him asking, Lord, uh, we've left everything to follow you. What will we get out of this? Hard to say what prompted him to ask the question. But if you're following the context here, something just happened to make him think of it. A wealthy young man approached their little group out there on the open road. He came so eagerly, so hopefully and unashamedly, and he left so sadly when Jesus rained on his parade and said to him, Oh, one thing, you lack. Go your way, sell everything you have, give it to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven. And they come, take up the cross, and follow me. He hadn't expected that. 
He turned around and walked away because she had great possession. Well, Simon Peter had done the very thing that rich young man refused to do. And was he thinking of it? The life on the sea which he loved and left behind. The boat and the net and the prosperous fishing business which he abandoned. Did he want Jesus to notice what he and appreciate what he had done in case he missed it? Whatever his motives were. I'm glad the big fisherman asked the question. For you can try to repress it all you want to, but the thought keeps swelling up within these hearts of ours. Does the faith pay dividends? And if so, what's the rate of interest? What do I give for all of the self-denial and all of the self-sacrifice? What's in it for me? The great thing is, Jesus is not at all taken aback by that question. He answers it as frankly and as honestly as Simon put the question. Verily I say unto you, there is no one who has left houses or brothers or sisters or wives or children or fathers or mothers or land for my sake and the gospel. But he shall receive an hundredfold in this time. Houses, brothers, sisters, children, and land. And in the world to come, life eternal. Jesus cataloged for you all the things you may have to give up out of loyalty to him. Please, they're not bad things. They're all good, God-given things. Family and friends. Houses and lands that are trophies of long years of hard work. But because they are so important to us, and because they are so precious to us, they easily come between us and the God who gave them to us. We may have to let go of the gifts in God's hand in order to hold on to his hand. Or the reverse may be true. All of the things that you prize may lead you because of your loyalty to Christ and the gospel. They may abandon you because of principles you will not compromise and standards which you will not lower. You may find the old circle has now ostracized you, shut you out, counted you as a maverick and a misfit. Jesus ought to know what he's talking about. His own family did not believe in him. The townsfolk of Nazareth renounced him. The people of Gadara told him to get out and stay out. Capernaum grew weary of him. In Bible language, he came unto his own and his own received him not. But I can promise you this, says Christ. And he individualizes the promise. Everyone, without exception, rich and poor, young and old, male and female, each one, whoever and wherever they lose anything for my sake in the gospel, they shall regain it in this world and recover every loss they've ever suffered. Many times over. A hundred times over. Jesus is not saying that if you lose a husband, you get a hundred more husbands. Who would even want such a thing? But he is saying that there are 
reimbursements that will outweigh whatever sacrifice you paid, whatever loss you suffered. People who have been to the doorway of death, halfway through even, and come back, will tell you that they not only got a second chance, they got a second life. Oh, if you can repent, if you can deny yourself and die to yourself, then you get your life back every day, many times over. If you can surrender to God all that you hold near and dear, God will give them back to you. Again, and again, and again. If, however, you hoard what is yours with both hands, if you think that your spouse is your own private possession to control and to keep, well, you got it, but only once. And only for a very short time. Jesus said that I will make all of this up to you. That's not fantasy. That's fact. Jesus gave it all up. And you tell me, whoever had more friends in this world than Jesus? Or a larger family than the household of faith on this earth? You older people the generation of Americans who will really disadvantage its children, struggling through the Great Depression, and then years of separation during the war, working long hours at jobs that were beastly hard for little pay. You learn something that all the prosperity of the world could never teach you. You learn, for one thing, that God can bring much out of little, as he did for the widow and her sons pouring the oil. But you also learn that there are values in this world that you cannot put a price tag on. There are compensations worth more than money can buy. That promise holds to the young generation as well. Don't buy the big lie. A man's life consists of how many things he possesses. God can put more joy into the little things along the way. A lover's kiss. A bright sunshine in the morning. A sandlot ball game. Sledding out there. The golf course. Then all the fun, the half-wit movie stars and oil sheet pads with umpteen limousines and swimming pools and yachts and palaces. And on top of all of the sunshine along the way, all of the love and the laughter the help, the strength, the healing, family and friends and courage and wit. There is this. In the world to come, I will give you eternal life. Now we see that world with dim eyes right now. Paul says, now I see but through a glass, darkly. But you do know what life is. And you do know what the word eternal means. The same Lord who supported you all the long day of this life. Till evening comes and the shadows lengthen. And the, this busy world is hushed. And the fever of life is past. And your work is done. He will then of his mercy 
grant you a safe journey, holy rest, and peace at last. But it's all a byproduct. It all flows out of your love for the Lord and allegiance to the gospel. See, it's never automatic. It's never mechanical. That's why Jesus said, be careful, because many that are first now are going to be last. And many who are last now are going to be first. The rich young ruler had every advantage. The adoring world at his feet. And blew it. Whereas, homespun Simon Peter has his name emblazoned in the book of life. Judas traveled three years in Christ's company. And he lost it. Whereas the doors of paradise were flung open for that penitent thief on the cross. See, it's kind of like the guy who marries the boss's daughter. His job is safe, and he knows it. <laughs> and that smug attitude carries over into his attitude toward his co-worker. Careless. Condescending. Snobbish. Our standing in this world can affect our standing with God. Many people love me, so why should I care about the love of God for me in Christ? I am warm and well fed! Why ever should I hunger and thirst for righteousness from above? I have a home with every creature comfort. Whatever would I do with heavenly mansions in the hereafter? We need that warning. God knows we need it. But do not let it obscure the promise. You will receive a hundredfold in this time and in the world to come. Life everlasting. Amen.